And I, I just wondered, have you ever just wanted anything, right? I know we all have. I know it's a silly question. Um, I know we want things. But have you ever wanted just more in your life? And I know sometimes like, man, I just want more pay or more time off or more love, whatever that might look like. I get all I can handle. That's okay. He made it. Y'all are, need some help today. <laughs> but here's the thing. I mean, you know, and my kids sometimes, you know, ask for more, right? Anybody got that problem at home? Josh asks me all the time, Dad, and he doesn't say you know, what he wants, it's need. Dad, we need a four-wheeler. He tells me this almost every single day. And I, my response is, you need a job. <laughs> and so, you know, there's a difference between what we need and, and what we want, right? But it's okay at times to go, you know, God, I want more. If it's more of the right thing. If it's more of the right stuff. And so my, my prayer in my heart is that we would want immeasurably more of him. Right? Think about that. Have you ever, not just, let's just for a second do this. Instead of asking, God, I, I want more of this, why don't we ask God this? God, what do you want? That's one for you to think about. Would you be willing this morning just to go, God, what do you want to do in and through my life? Now that's, that's a big question. That's a scary question. I get it, because that's you're asking the God of the universe, what do you want to do in and through my life? Amen. And the other thing to think through is, Lord, what do you want to do in and through the life of your church here at Crossroads? Because that's another big question to ask. Not what does the pastor want, not what do the deacons want, not what do you want, but God, what do you want to see and do in and through the life of Crossroads? Those are really big questions, and those are the questions that we want to start asking ourselves through this series, series is, God, what do you want? What do you want to do in and through me? What do you want to do in and through your church? And I believe God's going to give us those answers. I think he'll be start giving them some of us to us this morning as we look at the text that he has for us this morning is Ephesians, the third chapter. And we're going to be in the book of the Ephesians for this entire series, but we'll be moving around to different, different texts. So we're in Ephesians, the third chapter, and we're going to be in verses 14 through 21. So if you have your Bibles, please turn there, take a look at those, and I want to read this text for you and then come back and talk through it a little bit. <clears throat> and guys, we don't ever want to read God's Word to finish. We want to read to be changed. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family on heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He might grant <clears throat> you to be strengthened with power, through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. That's the Word of God. And this is a prayer that Paul prays for the church. He prays for you. He prays for me that we would experience this, that we would know this, that we would be strengthened by these things. So I know that some of you come today being tired. I know that you're weary. I know that you might be stressed out. You might need strength. You might need encouragement. And I, I know that life gets hard. I know that it gets difficult. 
But I, I want you to know something this morning, that He is all that you need, that He is more than you need. He is immeasurably more than all we could ask or even begin to think. And that's an encouragement to us this morning that we would know that. And He wants to do so much in and through you. Do you believe that this morning? That God wants to do more and more and more in and through you. He does. He wants to do more and more and more in and through crossroads that he's not finished with you he's not finished with crossroads and we can stand here today and we can be thankful for all that God's been allowing us to do in these past few years all that we've been seeing God do and how he's been changing lives and transforming lives how he's been growing us deeper in our love for him and how he's been changing us and transforming us there's so much that we can stand here and just be thankful for and give God glory for and it, hey, I I just want you to know he's not done I don't want you to take a seat and just rest and go man things are just so good right now I want you to press further and further into him so that he might do more and more in and through you for his glory for his fame for his renown not for ours not for crossroads but for his glory and that we would understand that there's some things that I want you just to understand this morning that whatever God's going to do in our neighborhoods, in our city, in our states, even in the nations. Listen, he's going to do it in and through every single, every man, woman, and child that is his. Understand that. Ask the question, God, what do you want to do? And whatever it is he's going to do, he's going to do it through every man, woman, and child that is his. Meaning everyone sitting here who knows him is important to what God wants to do. You can't sit on the sideline. You can't sit out. You have to stand in. You have to plug in. You have to press in because everyone's needed. No one can take a back seat. No one can sit on the bench. He needs all of us involved in moving forward in his mission and what he wants to do. It's important for us to know. And what he wants to do is immeasurably more than er anything we could ever imagine or think. And no one, no one is insignificant to this task of doing what he wants to do. No one is dispensable. We need every man, woman, and child. So if God's going to do what he wants to do in and through every follower... If he's going to do that through every man, woman, and child, then we need immeasurably more of him in our lives. Amen? That's what we need. If we believe that that's what God's going to do, that whatever he's going to do, he's going to do through all of us, then all of us need more of him. We need more of him. And the question is, how do we get there? How do we see God do immeasurably more in and through your life? Do you want that? Do you want to see him do more than what's currently being experienced in your life? Do you want to see him do more in your, where you live, work, and play? Do you want to see him do more in your neighborhood? Do you want to see him do more in this city than he's currently doing? Do you want to see more and more of what he wants to do? If you want to do that, then we need more of him. In every single one of us, in every man, woman, and child. And so Paul prays this pray, prayer for his people, for the church. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from, every, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is. Now understand this, this prayer is for believers. This is for the people of God. This is for the family of God. This is for the children of God. Paul is praying to his father. Isn't that such a graceful thing to be able to do? As his children has been adopted into his family, that we get to call God Father, that he's chosen to say that we're his children, that he's made it possible for us to be a part of his family. Oh my, the grace of God, even in what Paul's praying, that he gets to bow his heart, bow his knee before the Father. 
And I'll understand this, not only is the father, Paul wants to understand, he's, he's the one who's named every family, every nation. He is sovereign king and Lord. He says, I'm praying to the Father, I'm praying to our sovereign king, our Lord, and it's him that I'm bowing my heart to. Oh, that we would do that more and more. That we would bend our knees, that we would bend our hearts, that we would bow them before him. Listen, Paul has made it clear, and we'll see this in other texts at another time, that we've been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That God, by his grace, has called us into his family, and because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, because of what we're going to come and remember at these tables today, that he's broken his body, he shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could be in relationship with him. And when we come in relation with him, relationship with him the scriptures tell us that we've been seated with him in the heavenly places and because we've been seated with him because we are his family it means that we've been given the power and the ability ability we've been enabled to walk in the fullness of God and we've been able to stand against the devil's schemes but the only way that we can do that the posture of our hearts to be able to do that is to bend our knee and bend our hearts before him We cannot stand, we cannot fight, we cannot walk, we cannot live this life that God's called us to live apart from our bending our knees and our hearts in prayer to Him. cannot happen. So if you want to see God do immeasurably more in your heart and your life, you've got to posture your heart in a posture of prayer. You've got to bend your knee. You've got to humble yourself before him. Acknowledge that he's your dad. Acknowledge that he's your father. That he's the sovereign king, Lord of lords. And that you are in desperate need of him. That he be the one that we cry out to. That he be the one that we pray. That posture that enables our standing and our walking is the bowing of our hearts. The bowing of our knees before him. And Paul says this. Not only is he praying that, he says, I pray this according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. According to the riches of his glory. Do you know how immeasurable that is? He says, according to these riches, I'm asking that God would strengthen you. Do you know what the strength that he sent us was? Do you know what his riches are? It's the gift of his Holy Spirit. Because that's what Jesus tells us, hey, i got to leave so that Spirit, so the Helper can come. He says, and when he was with them at the last days before he was ascended, he says, when I, when I leave, when I go, they're gonna, the Spirit's going to come and he's going to give you power. That's the riches of his grace that God has granted us, the Spirit of God, to live in us. Oh, what the grace of God. Not only to provide a way for salvation, but to provide a way and the power to live the life that he's called us to live. This life that he's called us to live is the life of immeasurably more. He wants to do so much more in and through you and so much more in and through crossroads. The question is, are we experiencing the immeasurably more life? Are you seeing and experiencing more of his spirit in your heart and your life? Listen, he has given us Everything that we need for the immeasurably more life. And he's done that by the gift of his spirit, by sending the spirit to us, to live in us, to indwell in us. He says, strengthen them with power through your spirit and your inner man. Listen, his strength, his power, again, is what makes it possible for you and I to live this life that we know that God's called us to live. He's the one that empowers us to actually follow him, to be his followers, to live a life of obedience, to live a life of knowing him and loving him and treasuring him. We can't do that apart from him. And his power. We need the Spirit of God to enable us. So, what do you need? If you want to live the more of the immeasurably more life, you need more of the Holy Spirit in and through your life. So, this inner being, what what exactly is this that he's talking about? Listen, this is your greatest need, is your inner man, your inner being, your heart. It's your greatest 
source of weakness. It's your greatest source of conflict. The scripture makes it very clear. That's even where wars come from among you. They come from within your own desires, from your inner man. That is our greatest need, is to humble ourselves and to have the Spirit of God in control of the inner man. You need that. Because apart from that, we can't live this life that God's called us to live. This inner man is a great need for us. Listen, to this is what God cares about. He cares about your heart. He cares about the inner man. God will tell us all the time, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. He says, I'm not going to judge you what's going on outside. I want to know what's in your heart. So today, God wants to know what's in your heart. And the question is, is it him? Is it His Spirit empowering you, filling you up to live this life of the immeasurably more that God has for us that He wants to do in and through your life? He wants to do so much more. So you might want to know, why is this important? Why is it important that God cares about my heart and cares about what's in my heart and cares whether the Spirit of God's indwelling me and empowering the inner man or not? Listen, whatever you feed the inner man is what's going to come out. Tell my kids all the time, garbage in, garbage out. You put garbage in, you watch garbage, you listen to garbage, you hang around garbage, you're going to smell like it and it's going to come out. And so the question is, are you putting yourself in a place so that the Spirit of God can reside in your heart? Are you getting more and more of the Spirit of God? Because that's what we need, we're in need of. That's what your inner man needs more than anything else is for the Spirit of God to come in and to change and rule and reign over your spirit, over your heart. Because whatever gets in your heart, listen, This is why it's important. I don't know where you want your life to go. I don't know what you want it to be like. I don't know what you want it to experience. But I know this. Whatever's in your heart determines the direction of your life. That's how important this is. Whatever has your heart determines the direction of your life. It's going to determine whether you have a life of death or a life of life. Eternal life. So ask yourself, is Is the Spirit of God reigning and ruling over the inner man, or is it the stuff in this world? Am I filling it with garbage? Am I filling it with stuff that doesn't matter? And am I honestly asking, God, what do you want? Not what I want, but God, what do you want me to do with my life, with my resources, with my treasures, with my with my all that you've given me with my time, my talents. What do you want to do? Not what I want, but God, what do you want? What does your spirit want to do in and through me? This community is not going to see a people who live a life of immeasurably more unless the spirit of God and the more of the spirit of God is in and through us. We need this. Desperately we need this. So what do you do now, right? What do I do with this? I know that I need to strengthen the inner man. I know that the Spirit needs to fill me. So what do you do? You need to take care of the inner being. You need to feed the inner man the Word of God. You need to be praying. You need to be worshiping. You need to be living a clean, holy life. That's how you feed the inner man, is you walk in obedience, not by your power, but by the power of the Spirit that's in you. And you do that by being in the Word of God consistently and regularly, all the time, being in the Word of God, worshiping and praying and asking God to help you live this life that He's called you to live. Do you know what else that you need? You need one another. You need other people speaking truth into your heart and your life. People need to know what your weakness is. People need to know what your strengths are so that you can be encouraged. And some of you sit in here every single Sunday, and I'm glad that you're here, but you need to take the next step in your relationship with God and your relationship with other people, and you need to get plugged in somewhere. On your seats or in your bulletin, there's a thing on our group link on Monday the 30th. It's an opportunity for you to take the next step in your spiritual journey to go, I know that I need other people so the Spirit of God can fill 
me up more and more so that I can be encouraged, so that I can be loved, so that I can be known, so someone knows my story, someone knows my weakness, so they can help me learn to walk the way that God wants me to walk and live the way that God wants me to live. You've got to make space and time for that in your life. So show up on the 30th so you can get plugged in where God wants you so that you can live this life of immeasurably more. God wants it for you. And we want to partner with him in that. So spiritual strength in the inner man, listen, it leads to a deeper experience with Christ. Is there anybody here that doesn't want a deeper, deeper experience with our Lord and Savior? If you're here and, you're, and you don't, there might be a more important spiritual problem. You may not know him. And you need to make sure that you know him, that you're surrendering him, that you're following him before you ever think about this aspect, that you want more of him. you got to get him first before you can get more of him. But do you want more? Do you want to know him more? Do you want to know him deeper? Do you want to walk closer with him? Being filled with the Spirit, having more of the Spirit, is the beginning of experiencing more of Jesus. It's important. It's what Paul prays for us succinctly in this passage. So he says this in verse 17, I, I pray this that you would be strengthened so that what Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So he wants us, Jesus, to dwell in our hearts praying for this. Now we all know and we, when we come to know the Lord and we, and we want him to come in, that he comes in and he lives within us. We get that as believers, that Jesus lives in us. The question here in the text, when you think about the word dwell, this is what it means, that Jesus fills at home in your heart. Now that's a different question. Not is he there, but does he fill at home? That brings some clarity, doesn't it? So when Paul's praying, I, I'm praying that he might dwell in your hearts by faith. He's wanting this. I want Jesus to be at home in your heart. And the question is, is he at home? When you think about your life, when you think about how you're living, when you think about the things that you're doing, when you think about where you are in your spiritual life and in your journey, is he at home in your heart or does he feel like this place isn't right for me? Man, that's a tough question. Now, have anybody, have you ever, ever been to someone's home and you didn't quite feel just exactly welcomed? Anybody had that experience? Anybody ever been to a church where you didn't feel welcomed? Right, we, we've had that. Had a gentleman grab me this morning and says, I just want you to know something, man. Your church, he says, I've been to, to several of you. He says, your church has made me feel so, so welcomed. You guys are doing a great job. And so I, I just want to thank you for at least making people feel welcomed here. My question goes further, though. Does Jesus feel welcomed in your heart? Does he feel at home? Are there things there that he would say, you know what, for me to feel at home, this has got to go away. This needs to change. You need to give this up. You need to be asking me more what I want and less of what you want for me to actually feel at home. And so ask yourselves as you prepare yourselves to come to these tables to remember him, ask the question, Jesus, as I come this morning, do you actually feel at home in my heart? And that you might respond to whatever he leads you to do. And so literally it means just to settle down that Jesus can settle down in your heart. Oh, do you want that? Do you want that? Do you want Jesus just to settle down in your heart, to dwell in your heart, and to be at home? And he says, I'll do this through faith. He says that you might dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, a faith that bows before who he is and what he's done, right? This is what faith means. I know that some of us have a, such a low view of salvation that we think salvation is, well, I've, I've prayed, I've asked Christ to come into my heart, I've got eternal life, I'm all set, I'm all good. No, no, 
Faith goes far beyond that falsehood. Faith goes much, much deeper than that. It's being persuaded and overwhelmed by His grace. Meaning that when you look at your life, when you look at your sin, and you understand just how much you're not like Jesus, that you're not like God, that you're not even close, not even the same universe, that you understand how overwhelmed you are, that God, by His grace, would come and lay down His life and wash away your sins by the shedding of His blood, that you're overwhelmed by that grace. That you're so overwhelmed by it that you place your faith in Him and it's a faith because of what He's done that you reorient, that you rethink everything in your life towards what He wants, not what you want. That's saving faith. That it actually changes what you want. It changes who you are. Because you're overwhelmed by the goodness and the grace of God. That you've been overwhelmed by His love. That He would dwell in our hearts through faith. That kind of faith that changes us. That reorients the whole life around Him and His mission. And what He wants. Not what I want. So for that to happen, we've got to have not only more of the Spirit, we've got to have more of Jesus in our hearts, and that's what he's praying for, that you may be strengthened to comprehend all with the saints, the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, to follow and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith, that you might be rooted and grounded in him. So he talks about these measurements here, this width and this breadth and the length and the height these dimensions of his love. And so what I think he's wanting us to say is like there is a depth that God wants to have in his relationship with you. He wants more depth in your relationship with him. He wants you to go deeper and deeper in your experience between Christ and his people. He wants to know you and wants you to know him on a deeper, deeper level. For that to happen, you've got to ask yourself, one, where am I drawing my nourishment from? Who's filling my heart? Who's, who's giving me the nourishment? What am I giving myself to? What am I feeding myself on in this life? And he says that you might be rooted, meaning deep roots, so that you can be nourished. Deep in the love of God. And that you might be grounded, deep foundation on which we have built our lives. This solid foundation built on the love of Christ and what He's done for us. So the question begins to ask yourselves is this, is is my life rooted and grounded in knowing Jesus and who He is and all that He's done for me? Because listen to me, this is why this is important. Life's going to get hard at some point, right? Right? We talk about that all the time in here. You're either going through something that's difficult and hard, or you're heading into it, or you're coming out of it. Welcome to church. That's life. And the question is, are you rooted in such a way, are you grounded in such a way, when the setbacks, when the discouragement, when the hurt, when the the pain comes in life, are you so grounded that you know, you know that God's working everything to the good of those who love him? That you're grounded in knowing that God loves you. It's important to be rooted and grounded in Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us. Because when tough times come, we're going to need that. So the depth and the deepening of this relationship gives us strength when hard times come. That's what it means to be rooted, to have a root system of of grace and faith in your life that's so deep and it's on such a strong foundation that nothing in this world could ever shake it. And that the world would see that and wonder. How do they have such joy? How do they have such peace in the midst of all that's going on in their life how how do they do that now i met with a friend last week from summit our sons play baseball together i was so encouraged by him he's young he's much younger than i am way younger than paul 
I only have a couple more weeks I can say that, so I'm going to wear it out. And it's been a while since we'd seen each other because of all the storm and the games being canceled, and we're just sitting there talking and asking, you know, how are you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. I just want to know what's God doing in your heart and your life. And he says, well, man, so I hadn't had a chance to tell you. He says, but I have cancer. And I was just shocked. And so they've already removed, in, you know, just before the hurricane, they removed a bunch of his colon. It's colon cancer. Not good. Removed some other things. And he's like, you know, we're just, we're trusting Jesus. And David, he's so, so good. He says, I, he says, I don't know what the outcome's going to be, but I know this, that he loves me. And I know that he's good. And he says, and that means me leaving. He says, I don't want to leave. And he said, but that means me leaving. I get to be with him. And he says, and my family's going to be okay because they're grounded in Jesus. Man, may that be my heart when I face, if I ever face anything like that, right? But that's why it's important. That's why it's good to be grounded in who God is and what he's done for us. And he says this, that I would want you not only to, to be rooted and strengthened, I want you that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of his love. Literally, comprehend means this, that you would apprehend and lay hold of it. You know, like sometimes you want to lay hold of your kids. It's like, if I just get a hold of you, woo! Good thing I can't run anymore. A good thing mine are older and I don't have to deal with it anymore. But if you've taken hold, taken hold of the love of Christ, have you apprehended it? Have you fully understood the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of his love. That's what Paul's praying for, that we might be strengthened by this, that we might grow in this, that we might be encouraged by this, that we might understand him in a deeper, fuller way. Listen, Abraham told, God told Abraham this. He says, look, this, is, this land is your inheritance. It's your possession. It's what I've promised you. He says, you go and take hold of your inheritance. He said, you walk the breadth and the length of it. Wherever you step, wherever you walk, it's yours. By faith, Abraham had to step out and take steps. By faith, you've got to take a hold of your inheritance, which is the love of Christ, and fully be blown away by the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of it. That we would do that. This is what Paul's praying for for us. That we would have this immeasurably more understanding of his love for us. And listen, this love never ever gives up. It never ever runs out. It's, part of it is dimensional. Part of it we can wrap our minds around. Part of it we can see the height and the depth and, and the breadth of it and the length of it. But there's a part of it. There's the paradox where Paul says there's something about this that you can never fully understand. It's so much immeasurably more than you could ever dream or think. His love. Meaning it never, ever will run out. Amen? That we have everything that we need in Him. And so, yeah, we need more of His Spirit, and we need more of Jesus, and we need more of His love in our hearts. So please, in your life, walk the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of God's love for you and take hold of it. Take hold of your inheritance, and you do that by being in the Word, by being with His people, by loving Him and praying. Listen, His love will never give up on you. It's far more than we could ever understand. It surpasses knowledge. It's wide enough. Listen, it's wide enough to reach every tribe, nation, and tongue. Do you understand that? That his love, it's wide enough that it will reach every tribe, every tongue, every nation. It's long enough to stretch from eternity to eternity. These are things that we can measure. These are things that we can know. It's high enough to make both Gentiles and Jews one <laughs> and give them life in Him. It's deep enough 
even to rescue us from the pit of hell, from the hold of Satan, from the strength of sin, and from death itself. And we know that. That you might walk that, that you might understand that, that you might experience that. Man, Christ is our inheritance. His love is our inheritance. Would you, by faith, just lay hold of it? In verse 19, he says this, and it just gets more incredible, more crazy, more immeasurably. And know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know that I can fully, fully explain what this means. Because God is incomprehensible. And to have the fullness of the one who's incomprehensible in me is amazing. So more of the Holy Spirit, more of Jesus brings us to the point of being able to be full of the fullness of God. Do you want to have all the fullness of God? If you want to have all the fullness of God, you've got to have more of the Spirit and more of Jesus. Now think about this for a minute, to be filled with God. This is the God who's eternal. This is the God who's almighty. This is the God who's creator. This is the God who's the sustainer of everything in the universe. And he made it all. The God who fills it, fills the whole universe, can also fill me. Oh my goodness. That's incredible, guys. Listen, that is incredible to think about. And God wants you to have more and more of him. Immeasurably more of him. So you need more of God, the Father, in and through us. Do you catch the picture of this? More of the Holy Spirit, more of Jesus, and more of God. It's Trinitarian. That God says, I'm not just going to give you the Spirit. I'm not just going to give you Jesus. I'm going to give you myself. All of me. Indwelling, living in you so that you could be a part of that immeasurably more of what God wants to do in and through you. And we just need more of it and more of him. And it never runs out. And that's important for us that we need more presence, that we need more provision. God wants to fill you. God wants to enable you. He wants to supply your every, every need. And it's important because you're going to be dominated by the very things that he's provided for us. Again, because whatever dominates you does what? Determines the direction of your life. And the problem for some of us is we're being dominated by the very things that Jesus came to set us free from. Some of us are being dominated by the things of the world, the cares of the world, the fears of the world, instead of being dominated by His Spirit, by His Son, and by the presence of the Father in us. It's the very things that he came to to remove from us. It's the very things that he came to set us free from. And yet, we're finding ourselves entrapped by that because we're we're not experiencing the immeasurable more life, because we're not being full of the Spirit. We're not having more of Jesus, and we're not having more of the Father in us. We're having more of the world and more of self in us. Jesus said this in John 15, 5, You can do nothing. Apart from me. He said, abide in me and I'll abide in you. And when you and you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And we need more of him. You need more of his spirit, more of Jesus, more of the Father in your, in your heart and your life, more of God the Father. I need more of Jesus. I need more of the Spirit. I need more of God the Father in and through my life because He wants to do so much more through you, through me, and through this church. And He continues with this and says, Now to Him, this is so incredible. 
to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that's at work in us, that we need more of the glory of God in our hearts and our lives, in and through us. So when does He move in and do those things that are exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think? It's an important question. If He's able to do far more and abundantly than we ask or think, we've got to ask ourselves, is that happening in my life? If not, why? If I'm not experiencing this immeasurably more, then why? And when we experience this, this is when it happens, when the Holy Spirit has empowered us, when Christ has indwelt us, when His love has mastered us, His fullness has filled us, and when that happens, happens he will do immeasurably more we limit God in our lives through unbelief through unconfessed sin through careless living through worldliness through bad attitudes through unrepented hearts that's when we begin to limit the God that we serve that we say that we love when we aren't having our hearts filled with His Spirit, filled with His purpose and what He wants, and we fill it up with what we want and what we desire, not what He desires. And we limit, we limit His power in our hearts and our lives, and God just wants to do more than you could ever ask or think. Oh, that we would just bow our hearts. Listen, some of you, and I say this with the greatest love, some of you are playing games at the foot of the cross and it needs to stop, and it needs to stop now. Some of you are coming here and you're singing songs and you're shaking hands and you're smiling and you're pretending that you have it all together. You're playing games literally at the foot of the cross and you leave these doors and nothing ever changes and God's ready for it to stop he lovingly graciously wants it to end in your life not because he doesn't want you to have fun no because he wants you to have immeasurably more of him because I know this that we are most God's most glorified in him in us when we're most satisfied in him Are you satisfied in Him? He's more than enough. And so this morning, we've got this important question before we come to these tables. There's some important conversation that you need to have with God. If you're playing games, don't come to these tables until you get that thing right in your heart right now. If you can't honestly say in your heart right now that Jesus is at home in my heart, then you need to get that right before you come to these tables. If you don't know Jesus, if he's not in your heart at all, these tables aren't for you. And I don't say that because I want to be mean. I say that because I love you because Jesus says, listen, don't you come to these tables. If you come and you take them in a manner that's unworthy, that's not not right, then you're going to drink and eat condemnation on yourself. And it's the last thing that we want for you. It's the last thing I could ever want for you is you to come to these tables in a manner that's not worthy and honoring to Him. These are for God's people and God's people only, for His children. Because we come and remember what our King, our Lord's done for us. Now my hope and my prayer is that because of your being here, that the gospel that you might have heard today, that might, you might come to a place to surrender your heart and just give Him control today and allow Him to come in and change you. And when that happens, man, you're free to come to these tables. But believers, in the same way, don't come to these tables in a manner that's unworthy. If you're playing games, if Jesus isn't home in your heart, don't come to this table. Just deal with that in your seat where you are in the next few moments and ask Him, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for playing games. Forgive me for not living my life for you. Forgive me. For whatever it is that's going on, Lord, if, I'm, if you're not at home in my heart, will you please help bring me to a place where that's true? That you feel welcomed, that you feel at home, that you've settled in. 
So I'm going to give you a few minutes just to talk to the Lord. And then we're in a moment, we're going to come.